Good afternoon. My name is Regina and I am a librarian at Lone Star College Sci-Fair Library. And today we are excited to have a distinguished historian, Susan Ware, and honorary suffrage centennial uh, historian join us today to discuss her book, Why They Marched, Untold Stories of, uh, of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. And just a few housekeeping notes, everyone will be muted. If you have a question, please type it in our chat box and we will get to your question at the end of our presentation during the Q&A session. Uh, Susan Ware is currently the general editor of the American National Biography and the Honorary Women's Suffrage Centennial Historian at the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Harvard University. From 1997 to 2005, she served as the editor of volume five of the biographical dictionary, Notable American Women at the Radcliffe Institute. Her research interests include 20th century American history and the history of American women, as well as biography. She is the author of Why They Marched, Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote, published in 2019, and has published books on women in the New Deal in the 1930s, biographies of Molly Dusen, Amelia Earhart, Mary Margaret McBride, and Billie Jean King. And she also has a women's history anthology. So right now, without further ado, we are going to turn the uh, mic over to Susan Ware. Okay, well, this has been one of the more complicated connections I've, I've ever been on, but I'm glad we're going to be able to go forward. Um, and I'm delighted to do I was determined to do this. I think we all were. So let's see if we can finally make it happen. Um, and I really wanted to start by talking about how I came to write this book. And I realized that um, women's suffrage and I go, go way back. Uh, suffrage has been part of my entire career uh, as a historian. I marched in my very first feminist demonstration on August 26, 1970, which was the 50th anniversary of women getting the vote. Uh, then I wrote my senior thesis at Wellesley on the Seneca Falls Convention. First two graduate papers I did um, at Harvard. One was on the local women's suffrage organization. Um, I called my first book Beyond Suffrage. And as the centennial approached, I really wanted to be part of it. Um, and the best way for me to do that is to, is to write a book. Uh, and my original plan was to write a biography of Alice Paul, who is central to the suffrage story. But if any of you ever tried to write biography, you really need a special spark between subject and author. And it just wasn't there between me and Alice. And I ended up... Uh, giving up that, the idea of writing a biography. Um, but I still was intrigued with suffrage. Um, and so my next idea was that I would write a history of the women's suffrage movement in 100 objects. I think I was uh, inspired by those best-selling books, The History of the World in 100 Objects, The History of New York City in 100 Objects. And I thought, well, how hard could this be? Um, this, you know, it could be fun choosing the objects. Well, what I found was that it isn't so easy to write history by writing about objects. And I really wasn't able to figure out how I was going to make that work. So then I went back and sort of put my biographer hat back on and thought, okay, <clears throat> maybe I can do this through as a collective biography. And there is a, a fancy word for what I did. It's called prosopography, which I actually had to look up on Google and listen to how you actually say it because I wasn't sure. All it means is collective biography. And so I chose, I decided I would tell the story through um, 19 biographies. Uh, for the 19th Amendment. And it was really only fairly late in the game that I realized I could both do biography and object, uh, and that 
I could pair each of my short biographies with a suffrage object that was linked to the story or set it up. Uh, and so even though it took me a long time to get to this point, the end result was why they marched, which really does have this combination of objects and biographies, which I think is distinctive and seems to be something that people really have enjoyed um, when they've sat down to read the book. Um, now, when I talk about the book, uh, people always ask me, how did I choose my subjects? How did I choose my objects? And I think one way to answer that is to say that, you know, my goal was always to write a book that would serve as a, a general synthesis of the history of, of women's suffrage. Um, I just didn't want to write one of those what I thought would be boring, um, top-down narratives that focused just on national events and national leaders. Um, I wanted to, but I did want to tell that story just in a different way. And so I knew that there were areas and themes that I absolutely had to include as a historian uh, as part of the story. Uh, you can you know, I'm sure you could figure out what some of these variables would be. Certainly the question of race had to be central in my story, in my telling. Geography, um, can't just tell the story from the East Coast because that misses out on a lot of the action. I wanted to foreground the issue of class because that's a very important one in the story. Chronology, I had to cover a period of <laughs> almost a century um, in the story that I was telling. And I was pretty sure that I wanted to include the anti-suffrage movement because if you don't include the folks who were opposed to suffrage, it makes it kind of hard to explain why it took so long for the 19th Amendment to get passed. So in my mind, I had a, a kind of checklist of who and what I needed and wanted to include. Um, but for me, the main determinant was that all of the characters and all of the objects had to have good stories. They had to have good stories to make the history come alive for readers. Uh, and, you know, here I just was so lucky that really since I was a undergraduate at Wellesley College, I have had access to the amazing resources of the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe at Harvard. And the Schlesinger Library is one of the premier, if not the premier, women's history repositories in the country. And I have had the privilege of researching there uh, for now close to 50 years, uh, and it's uh, really like we're old friends, and in some ways my book is kind of a, a love letter to the Schlesinger Library and how important it has been to me throughout my, my career, so that many of the stories and the objects that I included in my book were kind of like already old friends. I already knew them. Um, way back, but we had kept in touch over the years. Uh, I think one of the best examples of that is that three of the characters that I wrote about in my very first book, uh, which was a book about a network of women in the New Deal, three of those women ended up in the suffrage book. Uh, it's so it's sort of in some ways like a prequel. Uh, I first wrote about these women, Rose Schneiderman, Molly Dusen, and, oh, who's the third one? Sue Shelton White. Um, at the peak of their careers in the 1930s, and yet in each case they had very interesting suffrage stories. Uh, so it was wonderful to be able to revisit them. And the same is true with many of the objects. One of the most haunting is a death mask of Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which I used to set up her story. 
And I first saw that death mask when I was taken on a tour of the vault of the Schlesinger Library in my first semester at graduate school, and I, I never forgot it. It was just to be able to hold this in my hands and see it. It was just such a profound connection to this character who was so important to women's history and to feminist theory. Uh, and so I obviously held that memory in my mind, and then I was able to, um, <clears throat> to use it in the context of this suffrage book. So in so many ways, um, this book for me really is a coming full circle <laughs> to where where I started as a you know a young feminist and a budding historian, <laughs> and here I am now a, a senior historian. Doesn't seem real good at mastering things like WebEx or whatever <laughs> this this program I couldn't figure out, um, but it's been very satisfying for me to do this. So what I thought I could do, and thank goodness because you're going to have something to look at while you listen to me on the phone, is I could talk about some of the objects um, as a way into the history I tell. So if Regina can pull up the slide for the wash, yes, um, X out of this. Um, this is the Washington Women's Cookbook, um, and it was first published in 1909. And you just have to like it when it has on its cover, Votes for Women, Good Things to Eat. And what I loved about this cookbook, uh, and again, from thinking about my connection to the Schlesinger Library, this is in their collections. I was able to go into the reading room, hold this in my hands, and page through it. And what I loved about it was it was this combination of making a radical demand for votes for women. At the same time, it is totally latching on to a traditional view of women as the keepers of the home and the cookers of the meals. And so they're trying to um, use some of the more traditional fundraising ways for a cause, which is definitely not traditional. Um, and so, as I was paging through this women's cookbook, I noticed that there was this section in the middle. I mean, it was mainly just these sort of boring recipes with little household hints and all. But there was a section about mountaineering for women and what to take if you were going camping and how to cook in the woods and what clothing you would need if you were going to go mountain climbing. And I thought, well, this is interesting. This is not, not your usual cookbook. Um, and that was the segue for me into the biography that goes with this of a Washington suffragist named Cora Smith Eaton, um, who not only was the treasurer of the Washington State Suffrage Organization, she was also a mountain climber. And she climbed what many of the peaks, the peaks of Mount Rainier, and she even planted a Votes for Women pennant on the top of the Columbia Crest. Um, and that would have been my object if <laughs> it had survived, um, but it wasn't. Um, but again, what I was trying to do was to set up the importance of Washington State uh, and then be able to tell her story uh, in a way that sort of brought her to life. Um, and, you know, I think thinking of her um, tramping her way up, not in a long dress, but in bloomers, um, and mountaineering, um, all for the cause of Votes for Women, shows the lengths, or the heights, I should say, <laughs> that, that women would go in order to get the vote. So, next slide. This is Lucy Stone, and if you lived in Boston or New York or Washington any time from the 1870s through the early 20th century, century, and you saw someone wearing this banner saying, I take her paper, 
they would immediately know that it was referring to the woman's journal, which was the preeminent women's suffrage newspaper uh, published by Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell, and their daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, from 1870 all the way up, I think it runs until 19, 1927. Um, it was kind of a shoestring operation. They never had much money. They depended on subscriptions. And they were always trying to um, find ways to get people interested <laughs> in the paper and to get them to sign up. And so <clears throat> it was on one of those promotional campaigns uh, that they created this button, which again is at the, at the Schlesinger Library. And I use this object to set up the story of the daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, who I think is a profoundly overlooked character in women's history. I sure hope somebody will decide to do a biographer, biography of her because she's fascinating. And the story that I tell about her is how she got very involved in the Armenian Genocide Crisis of the 1890s, which was the Women's Journal wrote about extensively. And uh, I think most people know more about the Armenian Genocide of 1915, but 20 years earlier uh, had begin the, been the beginnings of the, of the conflict. And I tell the story through her and a young Armenian man that she got to know uh, in Boston. So again, it's making the story more personal, but it's also making the point, and this is why the Women's Journal was covering the Armenian genocide, making the point that women's rights are human rights, and humans ri human rights are women's rights. And if that sounds familiar, that's exactly what Hillary Clinton said at the 1995 Beijing um, United Nations World Conference. And so here I had a chance to give a back history to that story because in the 1890s, Alice Stone Blackwell was saying the very same thing. So next. These are a bag of, a pair of saddlebags. Um, they're about the size of a small backpack, and they were used by one of my characters in my book, who's actually, I must confess, a crowd favorite. Everybody loves Claiborne Catlin, who, for reasons nobody can quite figure out, decided that she would ride all the way across Massachusetts by herself on a horse for four months promoting the cause of women's suffrage. And all of her belongings for the four month trip had to fit in these saddlebags. So a change of clothes, a rain jacket, the pamphlets she's handing out. Uh, she even had to have some uh, extra supplies for her horse, uh, you know, a horse blanket for when he's bedded down at night. And there was just something so tactile about having this, having these saddlebags uh, and thinking about them making this journey. Uh, and I think that she really understood that she was doing something unusual and noteworthy because not only did she save her saddlebags, she also saved clippings from her trip, the local newspapers, when she would ride into town, and she wrote up a memoir of her experience when she's out on the road. And again, it's a way of, it's a window into what ordinary, what extraordinary lengths ordinary women would go to. Uh, and I think it really um, is, is a way of showing how passionate and committed 
um, many suffragists were to the cause. And what was really interesting for me when I read her diary was seeing that she had what we would now call something like a Me Too moment, where she's a single woman out by herself at night, always alone. And there's one time when a man comes on to her, and it really could have ended badly. She stared him down, and he left her alone. Um, but again, it just makes you realize that these are not just women way in the past who are different from us. They're confronting many of the things we are today. Um, so she was definitely going to go in the book. Next slide. Well, if any of you are fluent in German, uh, you can translate this and read it. Uh, it is obviously a, a flyer for Votes for Women that is designed to make the case to immigrant voters. And one reason why this is such an important document is we always have to remember that who gets to decide whether women get to vote? It's going to be male voters and it's going to be male politicians. So both those groups have to be convinced. Uh, and especially at the end stages of the suffrage movement, uh, also coincided with a time of enormous immigration into the United States, uh, especially from Europe. So many of the male voters who were voting on suffrage referendum um, had come from countries like Russia or Poland or Germany or France. And since there weren't all that many suffrage speakers who were fluent in multiple languages, the suffrage movement came up with this idea of making all these flyers that could be passed out, and then you take them home, and hopefully the family talks about them, and that it's a way of presenting the arguments for suffrage and also trying to win support. Um, and I use these Foreign, this foreign language flyer to set up the story of Rose Schneiderman, um, a working class activist uh, and suffragist who was a garment worker in New York, very involved in the labor movement, but a woman who came to realize that the only way that women, the terrible conditions under which women labored at the time were going to be changed was by legislation. And the way to get legislation passed was to get the attention of politicians. And how do you do that if you don't have the vote? And so she really made the case, which I think is a very persuasive one, that working women needed the vote to improve their lives. Um, and one of the things that um, I hadn't known before I re revisited Rose Schneiderman's life was that there's a wonderful juxtaposition at the, at the end that I use at the end of my chapter where she had come with her family from Russia in 1890, but only decided to take out citizenship papers around 1916, 1917 which is just when a major suffrage referendum um, is about to pass in New York State. And so there's this wonderful um, congruence of her becoming a citizen and becoming a voter at the same time. Uh, and again, I think it's a, it was a way of sort of telling her story and using it to reach out, branch out to broader issues, but also always having her right there at the center. Next one. I'm sure many of you know that this is Sojourner Truth, um, but you may not know what this actual picture is. It's called a carte de visite. It's like a small postcard. And I'm so used to seeing this picture reproduced in books and in textbooks, 
but the real carte de visite are much smaller. They're basically two and a half by four inches, which is well smaller than <laughs> smaller than an iPhone. Um, and these were um, developed in the 1840s and 50s as a way of reproducing fairly cheaply um, images. And what was so distinctive about Sojourner Truth is that she would, she had these cards made, and when she would go around and lecture for women's rights and for anti-slavery, she would sell these cartes de visite, um, I think for 25 cents each, and that was how she supported herself and her career as a lecturer. And so I think you should be able to see on your screen the, um, the, the uh, caption, I sell the shadow to support the, sub, the substance. And shadow was a word that was associated <clears throat> with photography. So it's a very clever um, play on words. Uh, and it then sets up not only telling her story, um, which is one of the early stories because it talks about the importance of anti-slavery um, influencing the early women's rights movement, um, but it also ranges more broadly about the complicated place of African-American women in the dominant suffrage movement. Um, I'm sure if you've been following any of the coverage of the suffrage centennial, um, certainly one of the things a lot of those of us uh, out on the suffrage hustings have been talking about is confronting the racism of the white leadership, but at the same time foregrounding the contributions of African American women and other women of color to the movement throughout its long history. And to me, that has been one of the most satisfying uh, outcomes of this, of all the attention that the centennial has, has gotten, really broadening our sense of who were suffragists. And you can't have, you can't tell that story without starting with, um, with Sojourner Truth. And if I could have the final slide. And the other African-American woman <clears throat> is Mary Church Terrell. This is not Mary Church Terrell. This is Atlas and a female helper who's holding him, helping him hold up the world. Um, but this is a poster from an international uh, Women's Suffrage Alliance conference in Budapest in 1913. And remember earlier I talked about having a checklist of things that I wanted to include in my book. And one of them was to show how much the United States movement was in conversation with reformers and activists and suffragists from throughout the world. And this dates back to 1840 when Elizabeth Cady Stanton goes to a anti-slavery convention on her honeymoon in England. Um, and you see these suffragists all just every year traipsing around the globe going to these international conferences where they are meeting with other like-minded women. Uh, and so I knew that that was an important, um, an important part of the, of the story. Uh, and I use this Budapest um, poster to set up the story of the African-American activist Mary Church Terrell. And the story that I tell about her is from an earlier conference in 1904 in Berlin where she is asked to come and speak about the condition of African-American women in the United States. And she lives in Washington. She has a small child. She thinks, how in the world can I possibly do this? But she decides it is so 
so important um, that what she has to say that she's just she's going to be able she's going to make the trip no matter what and she carefully writes a lecture to be given to this conference um, and then she gets there and she realizes that she is the only woman of color who has been invited and it's more complicated than that because she is very light-skinned the Europeans don't necessarily don't realize that she is in fact African-American so two things happen when she gets up to give her speech the first is that she has decided that she will give it in German because and she knows German because she went to Oberlin and studied in Germany after after college because she wants them to hear what she has to say in real time you know rather than waiting three months for the conference proceedings to be um, to be translated and she wants them to know that she is an African-American woman whose life is just 40 years removed from slavery and so she stands up and gives this amazing speech uh, and I just knew that that was a story that I wanted to tell um, and I just I knew that Mary Church Terrell was someone who just had to be in my book she's her interests were as were all the african-american suffragists much broader than just the suffrage movement um, she as late as the 1940s when she's in her 80s is protesting segregated lunch counters in Washington DC this is a lifelong commitment to human rights civil rights and women's rights and so uh, having Sojourner True story her story and also that of Ida B. Wells um, was such an important goal for me. So I think that sort of gives you a sense for those of you who, who haven't had time to spend time with my book of how I was able to use objects to then set up stories that then when read all together really do tell a fairly comprehensive um, history of the women's suffrage movement um, and I hope you can tell uh, from my voice uh, you would be able to see it even more if you could see me in video because I would be smiling what a what a fun time I had writing this book um, because I got to you know revisit old characters that I already knew and meet new ones and figure out the objects and then as a writer face the challenge of how in the world am I going to make this book work uh, and you know how is it how is it going to all come together and have a beginning and a middle and an end and all those fun questions that challenge a writer anytime she sits down to try and write a book um, but it had I think that the experience was a very positive one for me and I had a I had a wonderful time and it actually had a specific um, influence on something that I decided to do myself and I, I should have pulled up a, a, a screenshot of, of this as well but the very first image in my book is of a tree plaque um, you know, a plaque that goes on a tree that Carrie Chapman Cat, the suffrage leader, had had on her um, on her at her um, estate outside of uh, of New York City, and I use that as a way of framing my book and say, well, her suffrage forest is like a it's like a walk in the woods with women's history, but it's only white suffragists, it's only women from that from New England it's not the adequate vision of diversity that we want to do um, and at some point and I'm not quite sure when I decided that I would create my own suffrage forest on my farm up in New Hampshire which is where I am at the moment and I commissioned um, 
bronze plaques, and I figured out a short trail where I could mount the plaques on the trees, and um, and I did it. And it has been one of the most satisfying things I have ever done as a historian. Uh, I walk down there, and I just have a sense of the history. It's going to be there long after I'm gone. Um, and as I, as I am sure, um, the trees and the women are talking to each other. And I have just a very short clip of what the suffrage forest is like. And then I'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, Susan, I'm going to try to pull that up. One moment. Okay, is everyone able to see the screen? Susan, are you able to see the clip right now? No, but I've seen, I've seen it before. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. I'm gonna go to share my screen one moment. Let me go back. Okay, I think everyone should be able to see it now, and I'm going to go ahead and so you just check in. Are you able to see it now, Susan? I am. Okay, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and press play. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> so now I'm I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint so that I'm just I'm not the only person on screen, but Susan, I have to ask you. So, is this forest open to the public? Uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> it's on our it's it's on our farm. Uh and I certainly always happy to take people take people down there, but um I just love the idea of it being there and having people know that it's there, and um, so I think that's its that's its um, significance <laughs> and its availability. But okay, so it, so one day, maybe in the in the uh, you know if distant future, in the vicinity of Hopkinton, New Hampshire, and they ring my doorbell. I will certainly take them down to the suffrage forest, and I might even invite my dogs along. So we'll, we could have a, a nice event. And, and as you can imagine, when it when I did finally unveil it, I, I threw myself a party up here for it. So it it has been suitably feted, um, and I think it's giving me quite a 
a reputation as, as kind of a local celebrity up here in uh, in rural New Hampshire. I don't think most of my neighbors usually end up on CBS Sunday morning. So, Right. Um, well, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and for, um, you know, diving into some of the objects and people you discuss in your book. I just want to mention to everyone, if you have not had a chance to uh, read Susan's book yet, we do have digital copies as well as physical copies available in the library catalog. You are able to pick up physical copies after you place them on hold using our curbside pickup service. Um, but I, I, you know, recommend checking out the book, especially if you are someone who is um, excited about uh, material culture and learning about objects, uh, history through objects. And if you want to go ahead and type any questions you have in the chat. Oh, let's see. All right, and is everyone still able to hear me? So if you were not able to, to hear, I'm just looking in the chat, some people weren't able to hear the video that uh, shows the suffrage forest. If you're not able to hear the video, I will uh, include the link in the follow-up email that comes out with the recording of this presentation. So um, I have a question, speaking of uh, material culture. Susan, do you mind if I read a, a, a quick excerpt from your book? To, to lead into a question? Sure. Okay, so I'm, I'm reading from your book. Um, Material culture is central to recreating and contextualizing women's suffrage experiences. History is not just made up of written documents and texts. Objects and artifacts play key roles as well, especially in the creation of personal and group identities. So when I, when I read that sentence in your book, of course, at the forefront of my mind were, um, the, the Confederate statues all over the South that are being torn down. And I, I desperately wanted to know what your thoughts were about that. Well, the, the whole issue of, of memorialization um, is, a, is a fraught one, as, as you know. And, it, and the centennial, the women's suffrage centennial, did not escape that because there was a, um, an original plan to, to have a statue in Central Park in New York City that was just Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and with no reference to African-American women. Um, and they did change that and Sojourner Truth was added. Um, you know, my, my, my flip answer usually is, well, that's why I have a suffrage forest, because it's much better than memorials. Um, you've got the sense of the individuals and being part of, of something larger. Um, it's, it is a very hard question. You know, as a historian, I, one of the things I try and do is historicize questions. Uh, and so something like the racism of the suffrage movement, you can't deny it, but you can historicize it. How did it happen? How did it play out? And um, I think in some ways we can do that with statues, and yet there are clearly points at which we just need to say this is no longer appropriate. Um, it's time to move forward. Um, now, part of me, again, as the historian thinks, well, I hope they at least save some of these statues and put them somewhere so that we have a record of both why they were originally put up and then why they were taken down. And if we can do that, and then what they might or might not be replaced by, if we can do that, we have a teachable moment for thinking about the question of memorialization and commemoration and what are our values and how, how do we uh, honor our past, but not in a way that excludes people. Um, and so I see it as part of a necessary and ongoing conversation. And it's not over yet. Um, it's going to continue going on. That's a, yeah, that's a great answer. But I think that's one of the things that, that many of us who are concerned with history um, 
or are concerned about with the statues coming down we you know we still somehow want them to be preserved and maybe in a, you know in a museum setting we want them on record so that we can go back and study them um, and I think that's where a lot of the um, where a lot of the concern and arguments are coming uh, concerning that topic. Um, my, I have another question. My next question has to do with the title of your book. You can see it here, Why They Marched. For those of you who do not have a copy, um, did you have a different title in mind when you set out to write this book? Or, um, because when I picked up the book, I originally thought it was going to be inspired by the the women's march in 2017 um oh. that was my first thought and so and then when i you know i read the back and i read more about the book before it came out i i didn't see anything any mention of that so i was curious what what inspired this title and if you did have a different title in mind at the time i i must confess that i i had a working title um that was called forward into light which is a uh, an old suffrage hymn that I'm very fond of. It was the National Women's Party um, motto. It was on many of their um, their banners. But as I thought about it more, that's a really fraught issue. Forward into light. It's sort of foregrounding the whiteness of the movement. And I thought this is not how I want to how I want to present my book, which is very much dedicated to broadening the story of who is marching. Um, and so fairly late in the game, I had to come up with a new, a new title uh, and literally did a session, you know, brainstorming with my editor <laughs> over a glass of wine, trying to figure out um, what, captured, what captured what they did. And obviously our thoughts were somewhat on the Women's March, which had already happened. Um, and I, but I think it also, it just gives a sense of the um, physicality, the momentum, the, what it took to get the vote. It's not just sitting around giving talks or signing petitions. Women took to the streets. And I think it's what I like about the title is it gives a sense of women really leaving their homes, going out into the public world, taking a stand in a in a very public way, uh, and I think it it really does capture that. Um, and so I'm glad that it. I think it worked out um, pretty well at the end. Um, and you know, and then I think, but it also I think if you look at the book. If you you know physically look at the cover, you would never think this was a book about the 2017. It's clearly a history book, you know, with the horses and and the women in long dresses and and for some reason I've never figured out. There's a woman reclining on top of my name on the cover. <laughs> I'm not quite <laughs> sure what why what that is. Um, but you know, obviously, what I was trying to do this with this book and with all my activities in the suffrage centennial is put the history, which I care so much about as a historian, as a feminist, in conversation with where we are today um, and all that's happened for women in the years intervening, in the 100 years, and all that hasn't happened. Um, you know, there's still so much more to be done. And I sometimes wonder, you know, if my suffragists could somehow be, you know, time travel forward to, the, to, to, to today, what would they think? Would they think, wow, you know, women have really accomplished a lot? Or would they say, boy, I would have thought they would be further along. We would be further along by now. And I, I suspect it's a little bit of both. Um, but, you know, one of the great joys of being a historian and having a broader audience is being able to take the history that I care about so much and share it with general audiences. And that was why the centennial was such a good kind of hook for that, because it got people interested in the suffrage movement uh, that many people who knew nothing about it when they started. Um, I was kind of surprised that 
most people started pretty much from zero. Um, but on the other hand, once they got into the story, they seemed to be hooked. So. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a great answer. And I hadn't even noticed the the woman reclining on your your name on the book cover until you pointed that out. I don't. Um, and yeah, that it's interesting, but I do love the cover and I saw the images on the cover and I, I just thought the title, I thought maybe, um, in the prologue, there was going to be something tied in, but, um, it was, I mean, I think this book is a fantastic choice to, to recommend to people who, um, have no idea what the suffrage centennial is, or they, who, People, uh, people who aren't history buffs or into history, and um, had no idea the the physical struggle involved with uh, women fighting for the vote and to win suffrage. And I have to say, um, I love how how the book places the women's suffrage movement in as as part of a continuum. It's not just an event um, uh, in a vacuum. And I, I feel like we get a great sense of that and your book. So I just want to let um, everyone know if you have some questions to go ahead and type them in the chat box. I'm going to read a, a few comments that we have from participants who were um, able to stick around. Uh, Eliza says, one day your farm will become an important historical place. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> that, that's the same thing I was thinking. Yeah. Um, we have someone else commenting that uh, Bronwyn comments that change always seems to require insubordination even now. And um, I mean, any thoughts on that or comments, Susan? Well, I think that's I think that's a very apt observation. And the suffrage movement certainly gives us plenty of uh, support for that, especially in its last um, decade when you have two rival factions. Um, you know, one is the more mainstream work within the system trying to get an amendment passed, uh, lobbying politicians, and the other is a younger, brasher, um, kind of take to the streets uh, brand of feminist suffragism. And I think both were necessary. Uh, I don't, I think that they, even though at the time they were pointing fingers at each other and saying, you're hurting the movement, we're helping the movement, that in fact, that having both those approaches was a good thing. And one of the things I do at the, at the very end of my book is I, I do try to draw some lessons uh, from the suffrage movement to contemporary political activism. And one of them is having this combination of working within the system, you know, the traditional lobbying and petitioning and whatever, but also the importance of public spectacle and really making a statement that everybody has to take notice of. Uh, and I think that most movements, most historical movements, do have this range of strategies and tactics and personalities, and nobody ever agrees on everything, certainly no feminist movement ever agrees on anything, um, and that's good. We want that kind of um, contestation and discussion and argument and um, trying to find common ground and listening to each other um, because there isn't just one way to go forward. And also, um, for many of these movements for social change, um, they need, we, they need all the support they can get. Uh, and it's going to come from a range of organizations and individuals and people at different stages in their lives uh, and in different parts of the country. And that's how social movements work. Um, they can be messy. Uh, and sometimes it isn't clear right away if they're succeeding or not. Um, but as Regina said, one of the takeaway points of this is this is an ongoing story without an end, uh, and it's going to go on long after I'm gone, um, and things change. They move forward. Sometimes they move backwards, um, but I feel one of the my main takeaway points from having 
done so many events around my book and around the centennial is I really feel like what I do now that I'm part of something bigger. I feel like I am part of this movement of women's activism that stretches back to 1920 and and well back into the 19th century. And I suppose I could get discouraged that more hasn't changed, but I feel empowered knowing that my small part in all of this is standing on the shoulders of so many women and men who have come before. And to me, that is a a really important takeaway point. Um, And I think it's also a good chance to remind people that today is National Voter Registration Day. Uh, And it has been very interesting talking about the suffrage centennial and women um, winning the right to vote in an election year where voting is very much and voting rights are very much on people's minds. Um, But I must say, I I haven't had to make the case so much about why voting is important. I think people, people get that. Uh, And I certainly hope that everybody who's in this audience and on your campus is registering to vote, will plan to vote and be as active as possible in both the national elections, but also the very important state and local elections um, that are that are going on. Yes, and I, I have to say, I think it's um, historians like you and the books that you write are um, important reminders of why it is so important to vote. Uh, and I know we have voting drives going on and we're pushing voter registration on all of our uh, social media outlets and websites and um, voter education. So I was thrilled and honored that you were able to join us for uh, National Voter Registration Day and help us celebrate. So thank you so much um, for troubleshooting with us today, hanging around, not giving up. Of course, I can't imagine you as someone who would give up because of technical difficulties. Um, But I do want to say Eliza comments that it's a spiritual empowerment to continue the modern march of today. And that is that's something that you I think you address in your book, how um, women who became involved in the movement, it changed every facet of their life on multiple levels. And I think that's important for people to to recognize that sometimes it can be a sacrifice. It can be alienating when you. you pick up, you carry the flag, or um, I just imagine uh, people coming out as a, as a feminist to a conservative family member and uh, their reaction to that. And then the same thing that the suffragists experienced when they perhaps came out as suffragists to uh, more conservative family members. Um, but it is something that it's it's also it's empowering spiritually and mentally, intellectually. Uh, do you have any comments about that aspect, Susan? Well, I think it goes back to just it. It can be kind of scary and lonely when you do have that moment where you declare your principles. But again, knowing that you're not the first to have done it, and that you're really part of a long tradition, um, to me, makes it easier. Uh, And it also, it is the way social movements happen. They aren't just national leaders in Washington or New York putting out, you know, newsletters and things like that. Um, Change happens on the ground. And I really wanted to be able to show that it happens with people you wouldn't ordinarily think would join the movement. Uh, and yet then it has such a profound impact on them. Uh, and they don't necessarily then go on to be the head of the League of Women Voters or run for president, but they have been changed. Uh, and to me, that's really one of the things I was trying to capture. And, of course, that's one of those insights that is just as applicable to any kind of movement that one joins where you care so deeply about something and you just decide that 
you are going to take a stand and you're going to put yourself out there and see if you can make things better. Um, and I think it's really important for Americans to realize that there is a long history of women doing this. I mean, there, we live in a country that doesn't know its history all that well, unfortunately, and it doesn't really know its women's history very well. And I think that a lot of times people are amazed when they hear how long it took, um, that women were willing to go to jail and maybe risk, um, risk dying by being on hunger strikes, that they cared about it so much. Um, and there are plenty of other examples of women in labor unions and in the professions who are fighting those battles. And we need to know about them, we need to teach them, and we need to share those stories uh, because they show us both what has been done in the past to get us to where we are now, but also often show us strategies or challenges that still lie ahead. Uh, and so, again, it's, it's what I've been saying is this way of putting history in conversation with our lives. I mean, I love the history. I love it on its own. You know, I'd be happy to live back. Well, I don't think I'd want to live back in the 1910s, but um, – but I also am very committed to helping people see connections to where we are today. Fantastic. Yes, and that's so important. Um, Bronwyn says, these examples from the past teach us how to have courage, and it's so important. And I think that's true. That's a, it's a great comment to leave off with today. Again, thank you so much for sticking with us and, uh, and the continuing with your presentation despite our technical difficulties. I wanna thank everyone who joined us today and who stuck around, um, you know, even though we started the presentation later than originally anticipated. But I do wanna uh, remind everyone, as Susan brought up, it is National Voter Registration Day. So be sure to uh, check out our social media page or the library's webpage for voter resources and find out ways that you can encourage your friends and family to register to vote or to actually get out there and vote early or encourage other people to vote. Again, thank you so much for joining us, Susan. And um, I cannot wait to uh, read the next book you end up publishing, uh, whether it's about Alice Paul or not, if you decide to go in a different direction. Uh, but thank you again. Well, and I'm gonna go you ahead. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm yeah. glad we made it work, you know. As yes, you say, perfect. I'm not the kind, we're not the kind of people who give up. So the exactly. suffragists would have been proud <laughs> that we pulled it off. Exactly. So, perfect. On that note. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. You. Nice, to, nice to be part of the conversation, even though we're so spread out. And yeah. everybody stay well and stay active and make sure you vote. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.